Hey guys, welcome to our chapter six presentation. This one is going to be a two-parter because it has got kind of meaty subjects. Um, the second part should be pretty quick, but I want to break this up into two pieces just to uh, kind of give you guys a little bit of a break. Um, I'm going to do one video, but it's going to be two parts, so you kind of like pause it at part one, pick it back up kind of thing. So what are our two parts? So part one is going to talk about uh, uniform distributions followed by the standard normal distributions. And then part two is going to be um, the sampling distributions and the central limit theorem. Okay. Uh, part two is very similar to kind of the applications of normal distributions, but it's talking about a little bit of a different idea using a, that central limit theorem, that special concept. And so I want to kind of break that up into its own separate thing. So let's get started with part one. Before we can talk about any of these things, we need to talk about what's called the density curve. So in our last lesson, we talked about discrete probability distributions, right? And that brought us to like binomial probability distributions, binomial random variables. Um, and we had that nice little formula and it was great. But those had discrete outputs or discrete possible values. A density curve is for a continuous random variable. And the special thing about a density curve is that the area under the curve is exactly one. And that gives us a really nice correlation between area under the curve and probability. And that's how we actually do probabilities for continuous random variables, is we find the area under the curve, under the density curve, for a specific region. Now, density curves also cannot be negative, right? Same thing for uh, probability distributions that applied in with discrete values. Right, none of the probabilities can be negative. Okay, you can't have like a curve that drops below the x-axis and comes above, but has an area of one underneath it. That doesn't work. Okay, so the uniform distribution is a distribution for a continuous random variable that has its values spread evenly over the range of possible values. So what that means is there's no kind of lump grouping in the middle or in any of the edges or the, hit, the tails, if you will. It's just kind of evenly spread out throughout the entire range of possible values. And that gives us a uniform distribution. A uniform distribution looks like a rectangle. So here is an example. There we go. I just jumped. So, um, this is waiting times at an airport. Waiting times are a very common uniform random variable. And so this is talking about waiting times at the JFK airport in New York for people to get through the security checkpoint. Um, if they know that at a certain point in line, you're kind of, if you hop in line, you will wait anywhere between zero and five minutes to get through security. Now you can say security takes a lot more than five minutes or whatever, but for this example, it's always between zero and five minutes, okay? So, when we're looking at this, since it's uh, it's a uniform random variable because any time in there is equally likely. There is no kind of, oh, it's mo most likely that you're gonna get three minutes or four minutes or a minute and a half or anything like that. They're all equally likely, which means they're e evenly spread across the range of values. And so we can actually see here, this rectangular image is our depiction of the discrete probability. Now, there's a couple of things I want to talk about with this, and that is, um, firstly, how they can be any value between zero and five minutes, right? I use the examples of three, four, one, one and a half, but you could have a wait time of 1.234567 minutes, okay? There is no jump. Time is a continuous thing. So we know this is a continuous random variable. Okay. Now, if I were to reword this and say something along the lines of, you know, your wait time to the nearest second, to the nearest minute, something like that, that could cause this to become a discrete random variable because there's no rounding because it mentions nowhere about rounding these values or anything like that. This is a continuous random variable. Now, if you look at this here, we see that it goes from zero to five. And in the middle, it says area equals one, right? Because we were told for a density curve, the area underneath the curve has to be one. And so where does this point two come from? This height of this box of point two. And what does that point two represent? Well, unfortunately that point two really doesn't have any real value in the sense of probabilities. 
Um, and so kind of given a vertical axis, uh, P of X is kind of misleading. Um, it makes it seem like, oh, the probability of waiting one minute is 0.2, but that's not correct. Okay. Where that 0.2 comes from is it comes from basically just figuring out what it needs to be so that the area is one. And so what we do here is we just simply take one and divide it by the range of values. So the range of values here goes from zero to five. So that means it has a range of five values. And so if we take one divided by five, we get 0.2. Okay, an easy way to think of it is figure out the height of the triangle so that the area of the, or sorry, height of the rectangle so that the area of the rectangle is one. Okay, so that's all that is. There's no crazy formula calculations. There's no com nothing insane or anything happening here. It's just basic geometry. We need the area of the rectangle to be one. We know it has a length of five because waiting times go from zero to five minutes. Therefore, it must have a height of two. Okay. So how do I use this, right? Well, given this uniform distribution, what's the probability that a randomly selected passenger will have to wait at least two minutes in line, okay? So to figure this out, it's really simple, okay? We can shade the area of this curve that represents at least two minutes. And since there's a very strong cor since there is a correlation between probability and area, in other words, we use the area as the probability, we simply need to find the area of this shaded region in this rectangle here. So if we look at this rectangle, we see that it has a height of 0.2 because the entire rectangle has a height of 0.2 as we found earlier. And this rectangle that's shaded has a length of three. So from two to five, we have two to three is one, three to four is two, four to five is three. Okay, so we simply take 0.2 times 3 to give us 0.6. So that means the probability of a randomly selected passenger waiting at least two minutes is 0.6. Okay, now there's one thing I want to talk about, and this is true for all density curves, for all continuous random variables. The probability that you equal a single value is zero. And so that's kind of weird because you're like, well, the probability somebody waits two minutes that that has a probability but when we talk about a continuous random variable such as time two minutes exactly so 2.000 going on forever with zeros it is almost impossible to actually get exactly that amount of time because how do we know you know it wasn't 2.01 or 2.000001 and so because of that any singular time is zero and so what's really nice about that is it really doesn't matter whether we say um, a wait time of at least two minutes or a wait time greater than two minutes or, you know, so if we say X is less than greater than two or X is greater than or equal to two, they're the exact same thing when dealing with a continuous random variable. That's not true for a discrete random variable, right? Discrete random variables have probabilities for singular values. But for a continuous random variable, it doesn't matter the singular value, okay? So that's it for uniform random variables. They're really easy. It's, it's basic geometry with rectangles. You gotta find the height so that the area of the rectangle is one, and then just draw it out and identify what region needs to be shaded for the problem you're dealing with. Once you've got that figured out, it's smooth sailing. So now let's move on to the standard normal distribution. This is a very special one. Normal distributions in general are what we're gonna focus the majority of our time on the rest of this term. Uh, the standard normal distribution is a very special one uh, because of rules two and three or properties two and three. So property one is it's a normal distribution. So it's bell shaped, right? Which means it has a nice bell shape. It's symmetric. Um, so we don't have uh, any skewing left or right. Okay. And what's really great with a standard, this is only for a standard normal distribution. For a standard normal distribution, the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. That's it. Now, because this is a standard normal distribution, a, we usually represent this as a Z instead of an X for the random variable. And the reason why is because Z scores are standard normal distribution, or are the standard normal. And so um, if you take any normal distribution, find Z scores for it, that maps exactly to the standard normal distribution. 
And so we use Z's instead of X's when we're talking about standard normal. So if you ever see a question that says, what's the probability that Z is greater than 1.3, you know you're dealing with the standard normal distribution because you see a Z there instead of an X, okay? I'm also going to typically tell you that on a problem, so don't be like terrified, like, oh my god, I have to be super attentive to that. You should be super attentive to whether it's a Z or an X. But I will also usually say the random variable follows the standard normal distribution, find with the probability of it being greater than 1.3. So um, don't get too crazy stressed about that. Now, the normal distribution is really cool. This is not the standard, this is just the normal distribution. It is based entirely off of the mean and standard deviation of whatever you're dealing with. And this formula here is actually what creates the normal distribution, that bell curve that you can see. Now, looking at this, you guys are probably getting a little terrified, a little scared, but I want to let you guys be very, very comfortable in the fact that we will never, ever do anything with this equation by hand. I just wanted to show you what it is so that you know how terrifying it actually is. You'll be that much more thankful for your calculator. So. A normal distribution has that symmetric bell-shaped curve that's centered around the mean, okay? And so this curve right here is something that you should get very familiar with drawing because pretty much every single problem, you're going to want to draw this curve out. It helps so much, especially when you're just learning these ideas. I can't tell you how many students I've had who are brilliant and stats is super easy for them, but they refuse to draw out these curves and they miss problems on tests because they accidentally did the wrong area or something like that. When I have students who struggle with this greatly, but they draw these curves out and they get, they get it right almost 100% of the time. If you draw out the curve carefully, it is so hard to mess up on these questions. So just draw out the curve so you don't try and visualize things in your head hoping you're getting everything right. Draw it out, be very clear, okay? So back to our standard normal distribution. Okay. It's a normal distribution with a parameter of a mean zero and a standard deviation of one. And the total area under this curve is equal to one. Now, there's a couple of things I want to make a note of here. First of all, notice that we're talking about the parameters here. So in general, when we talk about a normal distribution or any probability distribution, we're talking about the parameters, not statistics, right? So we're not talking about X bar and S. We're talking about mu and sigma, okay? Now, if we look at this graph, I'm going to use my mouse and come over here. So we can see actually that these tails don't touch. It's not like it comes down at three. These tails actually go on forever, never touching this axis. So there's actually kind of an infinite space underneath this curve. Yet, if you go into calculus or if you've done calculus, you'll understand that this can still have a fixed area of one underneath it. If not, just trust me, it does. That area out there gets so insignificantly small, it doesn't actually add to the area really at all. So we get this lovely little area here. This is a standard normal distribution, so its mean is zero, so that's why it's centered at zero. And its standard deviation is one away, so we have it marked at one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three. All right. So we can easily find these probabilities using our calculators. There's tables in some textbooks, so if you had a textbook for this class, there's tables that you could use if you found a textbook or anything like that, or you can look tables up online. The problem with the tables is they are very kind of singular focused and fixed on doing certain things, whereas our calculators have a much better flexibility about them to do different ranges of things and do things much faster and simpler than using those tables. And we have calculators, so why not use our calculators? So let's do an example with the standard normal distribution. Bone mineral density tests are used to test the presence or likelihood of having osteoporosis or kind of low bone density. Um, what's really cool is that the bone density test is measured using Z scores or Z values. And so when you get your bone density score back, a score of zero would mean you're at right at the average, positive would mean you're above average, negative would mean you're below average. And so what's really great with that is it allows us to use the standard normal distribution, which means we have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So what we're looking for in this problem is a randomly selected adult undergoes a bone density test. We want to find the probability that this person has a bone density score less than 1.27. Now you can see in this picture it says kind of it's got our labeling here. Now this right here the area equals 
0 0.8980 from table A2. Obviously, you're not going to know that going into it, so this would be written here. Okay. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the graphic without that, so this is what we're using. So we know it's since it's a z value, it's got a mean of zero and it's centered here. And what we're looking for is we're looking for less than 1.27. So positive 1.27 is going to be somewhere about here-ish. Okay. And we want to know less than that. So we're looking for this shaded area less than 1.27. So what we're trying to do is find this area. Okay. So how do we do that on our calculators? Uh, this is just saying exactly what I was saying. So we need to find the area to the left of z equals 1.27. So we find this by using our calculator. To do this, we are going to use normal CDF. So if you remember binome CDF, binome PDF, those are in that second and then distribution menu. Normal CDF is the second option in that list. Okay, and it has a very simple format, which is very similar to uh, binomial P PDF or binomial CDF, I mean, where we put a lower limit, an upper limit, and then we have our mean and standard deviation. What's really great about this is, so if you remember binome CDF only did the probabilities less than or equal to that value, right? Well here with normal CDF, we can actually set what our lower and our upper limits want to be. Now in this case, since we want less than 1.27, so we need to go all the way to negative infinity. The way we type negative infinity or infinity on our calculator is we use this negative one E99 or similarly one E99, okay? And you get to the E by pressing second and then comma. Now, let's talk about what these are. So if you remember, this E is scientific notation. So our calculator's way of doing scientific notation. So what these two numbers are saying, and so we'll just focus on the one E99, this is saying take one, which is really 1.0, and move the decimal place 99 spots to the right. So what we have is we have one followed by 99 zeros. So that's how big of a number this is. And that's the biggest our calculator can kind of handle. I mean, we could if we wanted to do like 9E99, but it doesn't really change anything. So 1E99 is perfectly great, okay? And that is far enough out there that it will capture any values that you need and your probabilities will be perfect, okay? So what I want to do right now is I want to pull up that calculator that I used. Okay, so I'm gonna exit out of this. Hold this calculator. So, now you may think this looks a little weird. It's just the screen is over here instead of at the top of the calculator so that things are a little bigger. So to get to the normal CDF, we just wanna go second and this VARS button to get that distribution again, okay? And then we should see a screen that looks like this. No matter which version of the calculator you have, this is what you should see. We wanna choose option number two, normal CDF. If you remember with, um, down to it with binomial PDF that was for a single point where binomial CDF was for a kind of a continuum of points okay come back normal PDF is used for a singular point however we just talked about that the probability of any given point is zero normal PDF is actually used to create graphs of these normal curves that you can do things with in your calculator we don't need to do that ever so you will never use normal PDF you will always use Option number two, normal CDF, okay? So we choose that, lower, upper, mean, standard deviation here. Now, I'll do it just a second. If you have an older calculator, it doesn't do this. So let's say we had done a problem and now our lower was five. So I'm like, oh man, I need to change that. So we can just clear it out. Take negative one. And then we're gonna go to second. You're going to come down to the comma button right next to the parentheses, and you'll see above it it says it has these two block E's, okay? And that gives us that block E for that scientific notation, the 99. Now we want our upper value here to be 1.27 because we want to know what's the probability that a randomly selected adult has a bone density score less than 1.27. Now, since bone densities are standard normal distributions, that means our mean is zero and our standard deviation is one. So with that in play, we place, let me paste. 
paste. Now, if you did not have the calculator that gives you that little menu to fill things in, you would type, you would hit normal CDF and then it would take you to a screen like this, right? And what you would have actually seen, let's get rid of, there. So you would see something like this and you would just, again, you would just do negative one E 99. So you do your lower limit, comma, upper limit, mean standard deviation okay and now you're at the same spot okay so it doesn't matter which kind kind of calculator you have it's done the exact same way nothing's really different so now we hit enter and we get that the probability that a randomly selected person has a bone density score less than 1.27 is 0.897957619319 okay so with that let's jump back to our slides okay so we get that probability we round probabilities to three decimal places unless it's told otherwise so 0.898 okay so what this tells me is that the probability that a randomly selected person has a bone density test lower than 1.27 0.898 okay or we could also say think of this right we We've talked about this in the past, or I've mentioned this in the past, how probabilities and like percents and chances and stuff like that have a correlation between themselves. They're not the same, right? That's why we said percents are not probabilities, but we can easily convert from one to the other. So we can also interpret this to say that 89.8% of people have bone density levels below 1.27. And so that is that little guy. So... Let's do another problem. I want you guys to try and do this one on your own, so I'm gonna to get to the next slide. So using the same bone density test, we wanna find the probability that a randomly selected person has a result above negative one, which this is considered the normal range of bone density readings. So I want you guys pause the video, use your calculator, find this probability yourself. Go ahead, pause it. You can do it. I'm gonna drink my coffee right now. <sighs> okay, good job. So, since we wanted to find, since it's a standard normal random variable, and we wanna find the probability that someone has a score greater than negative one, we just use normal CDF, the lower limit of negative one, an upper limit of one E99, mean zero, standard deviation one, and we get that the probability that someone has a bone density score greater than negative one is 0.841. All right, so you can read that, right? So we, another way to interpret this would be 84.1% of people have a bone density that is in the normal range. And that's it, it's not too hard. Nice and simple, okay? So we've done a value and everything below, We've done a value and everything above, but what if I want to do between two values? Well, it's really easy, right? So what if I want to find the probability that somebody has a bone density score between negative one and negative 2.5, okay? So this would be in real life, if you had a bone density score like this, this would in indicate that you probably have osteopenia, okay? Or some bone density loss, all right? Which is something that typically happens in older women, but could happen in anyone. So let's find the probability that a randomly selected adult has this level of bone density, or this bone density score. Well, our lower limit, upper limit, neither one is 1E99 or negative 1E99. Instead, our lower limit is negative 2.5. Our upper limit is negative one. Our mean and standard deviation are the same. And so we just plug those into the normal CDF. That's all this is. This section is really simple if you can identify your lower limit, upper limit, your mean and standard deviation, because it's just plugging it into the calculator. And so here we get a probability of 0.152, or in other words, 15.2% of people have osteopenia. Okay, so pretty easy. 
So get a couple different kind of notations. Notice here that we have, again, right, we have Z instead of X, because this is a standard normal distribution, so we're using Zs. So probability that A is less than Z is less than B is simply looking for the probability that the Z score is between A and B, like our last example. Probability that Z is greater than A means that we are looking for the probability that Z is greater than A, just like our second or our second example, yeah. And the last one, probability that Z is less than A is finding the probability that A, Z is less than A, that our Z score is less than A, which was like our first example, okay? So these are really easy, really nice and simple to find. Now, let's talk about something a little different, okay? Um, and what we're going to do that, or what we're going to do to do that is talk about something called a critical value. These are going to be really important later on. So this is a section of this test where, or this lesson, where you might be like, oh, we don't, this didn't really get used any. It was just kind of a vessel to teach us how to do one of the functions in the calculator which is true for this chapter, but this is gonna be a very crucial skill later in the term, so you must learn critical values and understand what they are representing. So make sure you are very careful with understanding these, okay? So a critical value is a value in a standard normal distribution, it's a z-score, that is on a border, well, that creates a border separating those z-scores that are significantly low or significantly high, okay? And the way we express these critical values is we say Z sub alpha, okay? And so this right here, this little alpha, it's that Greek letter alpha, okay? It's kind of like the fish, just don't connect the tail. And it is a subscript, just like an exponent, but instead it's below, so we call this Z sub alpha, okay? If we had a number for alpha, we would say something like Z sub 0.5, okay? And so what Z sub alpha denotes is it is the Z score, with an area of alpha to its right. So in other words, this is a z-score that has an area of alpha above it, okay? So let's find z sub 0 0.025, okay? So I wanna find this value. To find this, we're gonna use a function in our calculator called inverse norm. Inverse norm is great, okay? Inverse norm, the format for it is area, comma, mean, comma, standard deviation. Now the problem with this is that the area here is the area to the left of a given value, okay? So I say z-score here, that would be if zero and one is our mean and standard deviation, but we can actually use this for any, stand, any normal distribution, and we'll talk about that later. So to find these critical values, right, this alpha is the area to the right, but our inverse norm is based on area to the left. So what do we do? Well, we use the fact that there's a total area under the curve of one, and we simply will take our z sub alpha and do one minus alpha. So if our alpha, if we were looking for z sub 0.1, then we would do one minus our alpha, which is 0.1, to give us 0.9. And that means 0.9 is the area to the left of the z-score, which is what we can use to put into our calculator. So back to finding the one we were looking for, z sub 0 0.025. Okay, so we're going to use inverse norm, but before we can do that, we need to figure out what the area to the left of our, Z, our critical value is. So we do 1 minus alpha, or 1 minus 0 0.025, giving us a lovely 0.975. Okay, so to enter this in our calculator, we just do inverse norm, 0.975, comma 0, comma 1, and we get this long number here. Now, since it's a z-score, Z-scores are always rounded to two decimal places. So we would round this, this Z-score to 1.96, okay? Let's do this on our calculator. So, come back here and we clear this. Let's get to inverse norm. So inverse norm, it's just right with the norms, normals, binomials, which is second, and then go to the distributions. Option number three is inverse norm. Gives us our area, it's wanting the area to the left, so in this problem it was 
nine, seven, five. Our mean and standard deviation are the same. I paste it. And if you had a different calculator and you hit inverse norm and it just gave you this, you would just do the same thing we've done in the past. You'd type in your area, type in the same order that we did in the list. So 0.975 for the area, comma, zero for the mean, comma, one for the standard deviation. Those are parentheses, what we're looking for. Okay. Pretty nice and straightforward. So, now, what if we have a non-standard normal distribution? Okay, how do we find these areas? How do we find these probabilities? The first thing you need to do, and I cannot emphasize this enough, the first thing you need to do, okay, is to sketch that normal curve Label your mean and label whatever x values you're looking at, whatever ones are important to that problem. Okay, once you have all that, then you want to shade in the region that you are looking for. Okay, if you want the area between two x values, if you want the area above an x value or below an x value, or whatever it is you're looking for, shade in that region and then use your normal CDF to find the area of that shaded region. That's it, that's all it is, okay? I can't really emphasize how simple this is if you just follow these steps. Sketch that curve, use your calculator. That's all you have to do. Now, for those of you who are thinking about the test coming up, this is so easy. You don't have to worry about showing your work. Just, if you draw your curve, and then write down what you typed in your calculator, or at least what you intended to type in. Because 90% of the time, if you make a mistake on these problems, it's because you just hit a button too fast on your calculator and accidentally hit, you know, one instead of point one. So let's do a problem. Okay. What proportion of men are taller than 72 inches? Okay. So what's really cool is in Normal construction, shower heads are put in at about a height of 72 inches. So it wants to know what percentage of men are taller than a shower head. Now notice there's nothing, no mention of probability here, but we saw in the interpretations before for the problems on the standard normal distribution that we can interpret them as a percentage of people that have this. And so all this is really asking is what's the probability a randomly selected man is taller than 72 inches? It's the same question. Now we were given our mean of 68.6 .6 and a standard deviation of 2.8. That's not zero and one. So this is not a standard normal distribution, but it is normally distributed. So it is a normal distribution. So we can still use normal CDF to do this problem. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is sketch out our curve. Okay, so to do that, we sketch our curve, we label our mean. This is our x value that we're curious about, the 72 inches. We want to know the probability that somebody is higher than that, is taller than 72 inches. So this is the shaded region we have. Okay, the z scale is just if you really love z scores and want to use that in the standard normal instead of this, but you don't need to find the z scores at all. Okay, so that's our shaded region. We need to find that area. Use your calculator. Since this is a normal distribution, we can use normal CDF. The lower limit on the shaded region is 72, and there is no upper limit, it goes off to infinity. So our normal CDF lower limit is 72, our upper limit is 1E99. Now if you do this with the mean zero and standard deviation one, you're gonna get problems, okay? Um, but because we know the mean is 68.6, standard deviation is 2.8, we can fill those in into the mean and standard deviation. And what that does for us is our calculator does all of the work in doing any sort of standardizing or anything like that. And so we just plug those values into our calculator and we get our nice big probability here, which just simplifies down to being 0.112. So the probability that a randomly selected man is taller than 72 inches is 0.112, which means, that 11.2% of men 
are taller than 72 inches, so about 11% of men, or 11.2% of men, will find this 72 inch height of a shower head to be a little unsuitable or uncomfortable. Okay, that's all there is to it. This is so easy, right? You just need to remember that graphs are so extremely helpful and you need to use them. Okay, it's so easy to make a silly mistake if you don't draw out that graph, okay? The number of times I have seen people make mistakes when they've drawn out that graph is so minimal because it just gives your brain another way of processing that information from the problem that helps to eliminate these issues, okay? Now, if you want a nice, really laid out procedure for finding areas or probabilities, Okay, so sorry, this is going backwards. This is, we are given an area or a probability and we need to find what values, X values were used. First thing, sketch a graph. Sketch that normal curve, shade in the region you know, very carefully identify what, it, what you know. Then use your inverse norm and then double check what that matches with the graph. Okay, so let's do that. <clears throat> Okay, we are looking for, we want to find 95% shortest, 95% of women. What we're going to use for that is that the mean of women's heights is 63.7 inches, the standard deviation is 2.9 inches, and their height is normally distributed, just like men's heights. So, we have this percent, this 95%. So we need to find the x value. Luckily, looking for the lower 95% or the shorter 95%, that's already given us the area to the left, which if you remember, that's the area that our calculator takes in. So we have a mean of 63.7. We have some area over here. Now, if you remember from the empirical rule or just from kind of thinking about this, since a normal curve is symmetric, that means there's 50% to the left of the mean and 50% to the right of the mean. Since we're looking at 0.95 being the area to the left, we clearly have to be all the way over here. There's no way that this could be right here and looking at this area being 0.95. Just wouldn't make sense. Okay. So we've drawn our curve. We've kind of filled in the values that we need. Now we use inverse norm. So our mean is 63.7. I go back one, I say our standard deviation is 2.9, and we are looking for the x value that has an area of 0.95 to the left. That's exactly what inverse norm takes in, so area 0.95, mean 63.7, standard deviation 2.9, and that comes out to be 68.47, okay? Or if you want to, 68.5. So this tells me that at 68.5 inches, that captures that 95% of women are shorter than 68.5 inches. So, pretty easy, okay? Now, that's it for part one. Take a break, <sighs> take a deep breath, okay? To just recap, we talked about Probability density curve, okay? I'll jump over to part two so you're not distracted by anything. Probability density curve, which is the probability distribution, if you will, for a continuous random variable. The most important thing about that is it has an area under that curve of one, which means that area under the curve has a direct correlation to probability. We talked about uniform random variables, which are random variables that has values distributed evenly across the range of possible values and it looks like a rectangle. And we use basic geometric formulas to find probabilities there. Then we talked about the standard normal distribution, which is a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. We can solve all sorts of problems with that using the normal CDF. We talked about some non-standard normal distributions, which just simply means the mean and standard deviation aren't zero and one respectively. Okay, you could have a mean of zero, but a standard deviation of two. 
and that makes it not a standard normal distribution. Or you could have a mean of say 78 and a norm and a standard deviation of one, okay? But because that mean isn't zero, it's not a standard normal distribution. So it has to be both zero and one for it to be a standard normal distribution, okay? But either way, whether we have a standard normal distribution or just a normal distribution, we can use normal CDF to find areas, and we can use inverse norm to go from an area to a data value. There's a recap of part one. All right, you guys. Let's talk about sampling distributions. Pause this video if you need to take a break. Collect yourselves, drink more coffee, whatever you need to do, and let's start back in. All right, so sampling distributions. A sampling distribution of a statistic. So it's always going to be a statistic that we're talking about here because it's a, from a sample, right? Um, and so instead of working with individual values from the original population, we're focusing on statistics based on a sample. Okay, and the two that we really talked about typically are sample proportions and sample means. Okay, and so let's talk about kind of how these look and kind of their general behaviors. If we're talking about a proportion. So what's happening here, initial thing, we are taking these samples. So we're randomly selecting n values from the population, and we're finding the proportion p hat for each sample. So just like x bar is the sample mean, p hat is what we call this, is the sample proportion, okay? The population proportion is just p with no hat, okay? Proportion is something that's kind of a, a new notation thing, but it shouldn't be too crazy of an idea. Proportion is really simply just saying, you know, taking the number of affirmatives divided by the total number sampled, and that's it. So we're, it's usually kind of reported as a percentage, if you will, or sometimes as kind of a value between zero and one, and so it's really nice and simple. So we take every possible sample of size n from the population. If we do that, okay, then those p hats become our data values. And that is what we're looking at the distribution of. What's really cool about that is that the proportion is normal, okay, or the sample proportions tend to have a normal distribution, okay? And if we look at means, Similar thing, right? Randomly select n values and find the mean for each sample, okay? We do that for every possible sample of size n, giving us all of our data values. And that distribution of sample means also tends to be normal, okay? So, sampling distribution of a statistic Okay, such as proportions or means, okay, is the distribution of all values of the statistic when all possible samples of the same size n are taken from the population. So let's say we have three things, okay, really, go really simple. We have three different things, okay, and we're pulling samples of size two. That doesn't mean I do two samples because that gives me one at where all three things are in there at least once. We would need to do three samples. So if you will, if we have item one, two, and three. So we would have a sample with item one and item two. We would have a sample with item one and item three. And we would have a sample with item two and item three. Okay. So that's all possible samples of size two from that set of three things. Now write that down. Make sure you guys agree. One and two, one and three, two and three. That's all possible samples. And so that would give us a sampling distribution in that case. Okay. Now three is usually way too small of a number, but you get the gist there. So sampling distribution of a sample proportion is the distribution of sample proportions, or the p hat, okay, um, where we take all possible samples of size n from the population, right? Now, a couple of notation I want to introduce here, p hat, or sorry, p with no hat, just p is the population proportion. p hat is our sample proportion. Okay. Any letter that has a hat or a bar, some symbol on top of it, like x bar and p hat, are statistics, not parameters. So those there's a quick little notation we already talked about. Now let's talk about the behavior of this sample proportion. So what's really cool is 
if we look at the distribution of sample proportions as we get close to all perfect, all of them, you know, getting perfect, um, it approximates a normal distribution. And what's really great about this, even more so, is that the sample proportion targets or tries to um, estimate essentially, tries to um, get at the population proportion, okay? And so the mean or the expected value of the sample proportion is the same as to the population proportion. Sample means, I'll let you guys read this, is really simple, right? This is just kind of saying the same thing I've said a couple times. Here, it's kind of saying the same thing. It, the distribution of sample means tends to be normally distributed. Sample means target the population mean. What's really cool is that this means that the mean of the sample means, okay, so let's, we're talking right here. The mean of the sample means is the population mean, okay? Not as close to or as almost, but exactly is, okay? If you have all possible samples of size n, the mean of the mean of those samples would be the population mean, okay? So I'm gonna go back a little bit to kind of emphasize what's happening here. The mean of the sample mean is kind of really crazy. So remember, so we've taken samples of size n, found the mean for that sample, okay? We did that with sample one, sample two, sample three, and so forth. Those means, the sample means, are our data values, okay? So these are our sample means. So if I take the mean of all of these, that would give me the population mean, okay? Now, the central limit theorem. Big, huge idea. This is something that is so impactful, and it is used in so many really crazy, awesome, cool ways. What this says is that if you take all samples of size n with either one of two things happening, either n greater than 30 or the population is normally distributed. If we know the population is normally distributed, n can be less than 30, okay? If we don't know the population is normally distributed, n has to be greater than 30. So if n is greater than 30 or the population is normally distributed, the sampling distribution of the sample means can be approximated using a normal distribution with a mean mu, our population mean, and a standard deviation, sigma, divided by the square root of n. That is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of your sample size. That right there is really cool. And what's happening, the reason why we're doing this, so doing this, dividing the standard deviation by the square root of n, is gonna make our standard deviation smaller. So what that means, in, con in kind of practical sense, is that there's less spread of these sample means, they're less spread out than individual values. The chance that any one, let's go with height, right? The chance that any one man is taller than 72 inches is it was pretty decent, right? I mean, we can go back in our notes and kind of see where that was. And I'm looking in mine and we get that, it was 0 0.112. So 0 0.112 probability that a man is taller than 72 inches. But if we were to look at say a group of 30 men and see if what their probability of being taller than 30 inches is, that's not even close because that 30 people their average height isn't going to vary very much. You may have a really tall person or a really short person or something like that in a group, but the other 29 people are going to kind of balance that out. And so we don't get quite as much of a swing in values. And so this standard deviation in a central limit theorem case is much smaller. Okay. So if we are given a population with any distribution, okay, doesn't have to be a standard distribution or a normal distribution, sorry, it can be any distribution. We know it's mean and we know it's standard deviation, okay, and all random samples of size n are selected from the population. We can apply the central limit theorem, okay. Now, like I said, the requirements for this is that the population is normal or n is greater than 30. Okay, that's a really big distinction. 
First thing I would do when I'm dealing with a problem is I would look, is n greater than 30? If it is, cool, condition met, we're running, chugging with central limit theorem. If n is not greater than 30, I would go, okay, does this tell me that the population is normally distributed? Again, that's gonna be something given to you in the problem, not something you have to like figure out, okay? And so if we're given those things, conditions are met, and we can talk about this. So there's some symbols here that we use. So the mean, of all the means, the x bars, we call this the sample mean, or the, sorry, the, um, the mean of the sample means, or the mean of the sample mean distribution. There's a lot of different kind of ways to say it, but very simply it's mu sub x bar, okay? So this is the mean of the sample means, okay? And that's just equal to the population mean, whatever it was originally. However, the standard deviation of the sample means, or sigma sub x bar, that's that sigma over the square root of n, okay? This is how you calculate these scores. We don't need to, I'm not going to have you do it. Don't worry about it, okay? But these are the two symbols that are really important, mu sub x bar and sigma sub x bar. If you see that, that indicates to you that you are dealing with a sample distribution and not a singular, or not individual values, okay? So, if the population is not normally distributed and n is less than or equal to 30, okay, less than or equal, the distribution of x bar cannot be approximated with a normal distribution, all right? So, we have to have a normal population or a sample size greater than 30 to be able to approximate this. Now, you may be wondering what's the difference between 30 and 31. And it comes down to some high-level mathematics that kind of go into the proof of these ideas. Not something we need to worry about in this class. Okay? So, if I'm given a problem and I wanted, I'm thinking central limit theorem, first thing you need to do is check the requirements. Once you've checked the requirements, okay, reassess yourself. Is this referring to an individual value or a mean from a sample? If you determine that you're dealing with an individual value, okay, you're just going to do all the stuff that we did in part one of this lesson, right? Normal CDF, everything, nothing's special, nothing's different. However, if you determine that we're using a mean of sample, a mean from a sample, okay, then we're going to do everything like we did in part one, except our standard deviation will be this sigma divided by square root n, okay? That is the one change, right, in our kind of solution process. We're changing our standard deviation, okay? So, no, I'll let you read through that. That's pretty, pretty much kind of reiterating some of the things we've already said. Let's get to a problem, because that's what we all care about. That's what we want to deal with. How do I work a problem with this? So the elevator in the car rental building at San Francisco International Airport has a placard stating the maximum capacity is 4,000 pounds or 27 passengers, okay? If we convert this to uh, weight per passenger, we get that the passengers have to have an average weight of 148 pounds when the elevator is full. In other words, at 27 passengers. So let's assume, worst case scenario, we have 27 adult men in there. Now, why do we say 27 adult men and not 27 adults or 27 women? The reason is very simple. On average, men weigh more than women. Really easy. So, <clears throat> we have that. It gives us two problems. One, find the probability that one randomly selected adult male has a weight greater than 148 pounds. Part B, Find the probability that a sample of 27 randomly selected adult males has a mean weight greater than 148 pounds. Now, right here we're told that the, um, the weight of adult males is normally distributed with a mean of 189 pounds and a standard deviation of 39 pounds. Okay, so we're going to use that going forward. So let's start with problem A. Problem A asks us to find the probability that a single selected random randomly selected adult has a weight greater than 148 so we're just dealing with an individual value so we're going to do this process the exact same way that we would with that we did in part one 
okay? So we use normal CDF. We're looking for the probability that somebody weighs more than 148 pounds. It means our lower limit is 148, our upper limit is 199, our standard deviation, or our mean is 189, and our standard deviation is 39. So this tells me that our probability is 0.853. Okay, so here's our curve that we've drawn out. We're looking at that. So that's part A. Part B, we're told that we are dealing, we we're finding the probability that a random sample of 27 randomly selected adult males has a mean weight greater than 148. This is clearly dealing with a sample mean. And so we are looking at using that central limit theorem here. And so we need to ask ourselves, is the original population normally distributed or is n greater than 30? Since n is only 27, that condition isn't met. But we were told that the weights of males is normally distributed. So that means we're good to go and we can use the central limit theorem. So what we do first, the first thing we should do when, we're, when we've identified I can do the central limit theorem is we want to make sure we clearly identify our mean and standard deviation for the sampling mean or for the sampling distribution. So in other words, we need to find mu sub x bar and sigma sub x bar. Okay. So the mean of the sample means is the same as the population mean, which is 189. However, our standard deviation of the sample means is not the same. And we need to use our calculator to figure this out. And so we do sigma divided by the square root of n. Since the standard deviation of adult of the weight of adult males is 39, and our sample size is 27, we get 39 divided by the square root of 27, which comes out to be approximately 7.51. Now, as far as using your calculator goes for this, like perfectly fine. Some people will find these the, the standard deviation like this is to be 7.51, and that's what they'll use when they're doing their calculations. Some people will just put 39 divided by square root of 27 into their normal CDF calculation. Both of those are perfectly acceptable weights. You can absolutely do that. Your calculator can handle doing the normal CDF and also doing this simple calculation. When I say simple, I mean simple for the calculator. Okay. It doesn't alter your uh, probabilities much at all, if at all, unless you round poorly. So if you say 7.51 is 8, then that might alter your probabilities a little bit. So as long as you kind of keep a, within the rounding rules, you should be fine. So let's sketch this graph. Notice this graph looks a lot different than this graph. And that's just to simply reflect that here, the standard deviation is 39, which means to be within one standard deviation, I can go 39 below or 39 above. Okay, and I'm within one standard deviation here. To be within one standard deviation here, I can only go 7.51 below or 7.51 above. So it's much tighter kind of packed in. And this is kind of what we've talked about, what I talked about earlier with talking about how the means of samples are kind of balanced out. Any extreme values are balanced out by the rest of the people in the sample, the rest of the items in the sample. So we need to find this probability. Again, we're finding the area to the right. So when we do our normal CDF, okay, we are finding the probability in this case that X bar is greater than 148. So we use normal CDF with our lower limit of 148, our upper limit of 1E99, our mean is 189, and our standard deviation is 7.51. And doing this, we get a probability of 0.999999998. That's pretty much one. What that tells me is that if there are 27 men in this elevator, it's pretty much guaranteed to be overweight. And so this kind of talks about that. So that tells me that um, if I'm the elevator safety person, I need to reduce the capacity of this elevator. Can't have 27 people on it. That's way too much. Okay. Now, <clears throat> that is applying the central limit theorem. That's literally all you do. The solution process, as far as the actual getting the numbers, doesn't change. You're still using normal CDF. The only difference is you change the standard. <coughs> uh, sorry, excuse me. You change the standard deviation. Okay. Now, I want to introduce you some, to something. This is something we're going to bring up again, and we're going to really go into really deeply 
kind of the last week or so of the term, maybe the, the week before the last week, so the ninth week. And that is hypothesis testing. We've kind of talked about some ideas that kind of get towards hypothesis testing a little bit throughout when we talk about like rare events and unusual things and stuff like that. But this is kind of getting a little more into it, like a little more significantly into it. And what it really talks about is if given an assumption, okay, the, the probability of an, some particular event is very small, and then that event actually occurs, okay, we typically assume that that assumption is not correct. So what's basically happening here? Basically, if given this assumption we have, we think that something is very unlikely, and then that very unlikely thing happens, we go, okay, well, our assumption must be wrong. Okay. So let's do an example where we look at this. So for years, we've always said, what's average body temperature? 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty standard. <sighs> Sorry. That's pretty standard. And the population standard deviation of body temperatures is 0.62 degrees Fahrenheit. This is based on data from a University of Maryland research study. Now, if a sample of 106 randomly selected individuals found the probability, <clears throat> or now it wants us to then find the probability of getting a mean body temperature of 98.2 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. So what we're trying to figure out here is, given that we have a sample of 106 randomly selected individuals, what's the probability that the mean body temperature of those 106 individuals is 98.2 degrees or lower, okay? So to do this, well, uh, 106 is definitely greater than 30, so we can use the central limit theorem, which means our mean, our mu x bar, mu sub x bar, is just the same as the population mean, 98.6. But our, popular, our sample mean, the, our standard deviation of the sample means, our sigma sub x bar, is going to be 0.62 divided by the square root of 106. So this standard deviation that was already pretty small for an individual at 0.62 now becomes tiny at 0.06. Our standard deviation of this 106 sized sample is 0.06. So looking at our graph that we draw of this, we are looking for the probability that it's less than 98.2. The reason why there's such a gap here is because our standard deviation is 0 0.06, which means one standard deviation. So this distance here from 98.6 to 98.2 is a total area of, or sorry, it's a total distance of 0.4. If we have our standard deviation is 0 0.06, that means there is almost seven standard deviations from the mean that we are at right here. Almost seven standard deviations away. That's a lot. So we use our calculator and we get the probability using normal CDF. Since we want the area to the left, our lower limit is going to be negative 1e99. We're wanting the left of, to the left of 98.2 degrees. So our Normal CDF is negative 1e99 e to 98.2, and the mean is 98.6, and our standard deviation is that 0 0.06. I wouldn't put the whole thing in. You can just put in 0 0.06. Your numbers are going to be pretty much the exact same. And what my calculator kicks back to me is this. Okay, Let's jump and do that on our calculator, just so you can see I'm not making things up. Okay, So normal CDF. Our lower is negative 1e99, our upper is 98.2, our mean is 98.6, and our standard deviation is 0 0.06. Okay. And so it gave me a slightly different number, but still it's not even a big deal. So we get 1.315e negative 11. So what in the world does this mean? Probabilities have to be between 0 and 1. How is this 1.5? That doesn't make any sense, right? What we have to remember is what is e negative 11? e negative 11, 
is scientific notation in our calculators. What that means is that decimal place right here moves 11 spots to the left. So this number here is actually 0 0.0000000000152. That is so insanely small. And so with numbers like this and probability, this is where you may have seen this in homeworks and things like that. This is where we use something like zero plus, which is basically saying it's not impossible to happen. It's not exactly zero, but it basically is. And so because that probability is so insanely small, okay, we conclude that one of our assumptions must be wrong. Now, our big assumption was that the body temperature has an average or a, a, a population mean of 98.6, okay? Now, what's really crazy here is a University of Maryland researchers actually obtained a sample of 106 in, randomly, selected, randomly selected individuals with this sample mean, okay? After they confirmed that everything they did was good, their sampling methods was sound, their data collection methods were good, their data recording wasn't off, they didn't mistype things, nothing like that, they came to one of two possibilities are, are happening. Either the population mean really is 98.6, and they just got so incredibly lucky in the sense that they got this extremely rare event of having a, of a sample of 106 people having a temperature of 98.2. Or more likely, option two, population mean is actually lower than the assumed value of 98.6. So. Based on this 106 person's study, it would appear that the body temperature is actually closer to 98.2 degrees Fahrenheit instead of 98.6. Now, you can argue the merits of this and whatever. We're gonna talk about necessary sample sizes later on this term, and you'll see that 106 is actually pretty sufficient. That 106 isn't like, oh man, that's way too little. There's billions of people in the world. But statistically speaking, 106 is pretty good. That's really a cool thing. And we're going to talk about that later. But that's it for this lesson. Thanks for bearing with me. Big takeaways from part two, central limit theorem. If your population is normally distributed or your sample is greater than 30, you can apply the central limit theorem. The only thing that changes in the central limit theorem versus for an individual value is your standard deviation changes. And it becomes that sigma sub x bar, which is the original population standard deviation divided by the square root of your sample size. That's it for this lesson, guys. Have a great weekend. Good luck on the test. I did move the dates a little bit, so go check that out. If this is not spring term 2020, ignore the fact that I just said I moved dates a little bit because this video is created for spring term 2020. So go check that out, guys. Good luck with the homework. As always, email me if you have any questions.